I'll just move to the the summary. So, Brian, do you want to come? There's a lot in yeah. there, so obviously yeah. you have a lot to come back on. Yeah, I'll try to sort of um, capture what was said. And, and, and I think more importantly as well, in terms of this discussion, and, and as John alluded to, the North, what can we do practically to develop this discussion and to bring more people in the discussion? Because I think there is people out there who would be involved in these discussions if it's spelled out to them what the issues really are and what they're about. I think to set a sort of context, see, I've been working in the press now nearly 30 years, long, long time. I can remember when it first started, and I look at that spectrum to where I am now, and it's been hammered by cuts, redundancies, and digital changes. It, it, the industry itself, and what, what could have been reported, and, and, and the budget would have been allowed in papers for investigative journalists, those departments were the first to go, you know, and I, you know, you know, for, for all its weaknesses and, and in much you can, um, you can say it was awful journalism, but it probably was. Even the Belfast Hallerga would have had a fair degree of, I don't know what you would call investigative journalism, but you would have had a, a number of reporters and they would have seen that as a role. And when I worked there, that had been reduced to two, to two. And then those two both got jobs in the BBC. One of them has went off another ventures where he's now the spin doctor of the Department of Health. Um, but uh, that, that the landscape has just changed so much. And, and, when, and when, you know, WikiLeaks, which was a new thing in a sense, and its form of delivering information, working with publishers and, 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 and what they believe are, and are at times is have worked under them, those constraints and legal and, and checking things and leaving things out, you know, they had all those things. And uh, a sense of a different base that I would imagine from what I've read about it, that from them, from their perspective, he was very difficult to work with. And I'd say from his perspective, he thought that they were incredibly slow and lily-livered. You know, uh, you know I mean, I've, I've heard some of it, the, the discussions and the arguments, and it obviously it ended up that that relationship broke. And John's quite right. You know, what The Guardian did and, and the New York Times, etc., and Der Spiegel, um, they deliberately didn't in the indictment go after them. Uh, you know, they, they were, it was a case of, we will isolate Assange, we will spew out the stuff about the rape, the rape allegations, all that there, and we will make it that Assange is just this unpopular cause. And then also the fact that he was holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy. Sometimes campaigns last a year, two years, you know. This was a long period where there was, you, you heard nothing from Assange, it was in the distance. It, it just became a, a long, long period of a thing. Um, but I first of all say Assange, and it's something that's key to journalism, and it's so key, especially in these times, where spin doctors are, and the spads that storm it, people who, whose role is to really act as gatekeepers and to stop journalists, any journalist, of asking questions. I mean, since I've started the magazine, we'd done an issue one time, I can remember it was on a health issue, whatever, and I tried to get an interview with Robin Swan. And they, the people who, who, who I applied to for the interview with Robin Swan knew me. They knew the magazine. And um, it just wasn't going to happen. They used every dirty trick in the book. Lost the email, didn't answer the email, said he wasn't available on that day. And then I get them a, a, a whole plethora of bits and times. They, they just didn't want me to interview. And I kind of think that as a credit. If, if it was really weak, lily livered, they'd just give them. And I would just do a, a PR piece on Robin Swan. That would be it. They knew that I would ask him hard questions. You know, um, they knew that. Uh, and once you get that reputation, so whistleblowers is very important to me. At the moment, I'm working on an issue which I really wanted to do. View magazine, we would get funded. A, a big charitable a, a institution in Britain, Joseph Rountree Charitable Trust, like the idea in Care Homes. I'm now, I'm now working on one in Care Homes. Why were the deaths so high in Care Homes? I kind of know the answers, but I've got to get the proof. And if I get a whistleblower, somebody who really has the documents, whatever, it'll make the magazine's coverage so much more. You know, I wish I had a, 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 a local jury in the sand. He says, Brad, I've got all this stuff here. Will you share it? I, I would do it. At the risk of going to jail, whatever. If I got that information, I would definitely use it 100%. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the climate we're operating in now. Um, like Craig Murray, who you might have come across in the Assange case, 
who visited the trial numerous, numerous uh, daily and wrote really gripping reports about um, Assange's treatment in the court, etc. You know, he last year, around right July, applied to be a member of the NUJ and he was denied it, but he was denied it by machinations. In other words, the traditional way when you apply to the NUJ, your membership is forwarded to a branch. So if you're, if you're Belfast or somewhere else, the branch is, is supposed to know you. And then they talk about it at the meeting. You know, who is he? Has he showed some proof of earnings or that he's written some stuff? And generally, I've been at meetings and it's a straightforward process. The NUJ lets a lot of people in that I would let it, you know, who apply for membership. Um, so, you know, the NUJ is a very broad church of the right are in the NUJ, conservatives, liberals, the left. Not people think of the, the journalists, this sort of press reading, you know, it's not like that at all. You know, all the industries I've worked in, all the okay, I've worked in maybe offhand about six, seven newspapers, quite a few magazines. Sometimes, not that I wanted to be, but I was a lone left-wing voice in these places. I was always in the trade union. I was, I was always a member of the trade union. I was a shop steward. But the consciousness around me was really, really poor. People didn't want to put their heads up with a parapet, or they just thought their job was just to report this stuff and get the wage and, and, and climb, up, climb up the chain. Um, you know, I think that in terms of the judge's ruling, it's such an attack on press freedom, but it's a judge's ruling in legal parlance that people, you know, the, the idea of conscious understanding it. I think at some stage in terms of postage campaigns, the central points of what the judge ruled on should be broken down and put down. So it's very clearly saying this ruling is an attack on press freedom. And that publicity of that, that poster, that information saying that, 10 points, this is what the judge say, do you oppose these? Do you think these are a bad thing? Join this campaign. That idea of, of really hammering home the attack on press freedom. Um, and we can get depressed, we can get fed up. Campaigns go on, they're small campaigns, people have different views. But recently there was a campaign in Northern Ireland, we may have followed it, where they arrested the journalist Barry McCaffrey and Trevor Burney. And the NUJ threw considerable resources behind that. Um, London, the London branch, um, the full-time officers got very heavily involved in that. And I got a whole number of people, even the Tory MP, I can't remember his name now, who speaks out about the right of the press freedom. He came over and attended the court hearings in Belfast. And it's a substantial case. And the NUJ won, not just the NUJ, but that case was won. Not only was it won, they paid out compensation. The cops have apologized for what their actions, not, you know, the policing board made apologies. But in terms of a campaign, you could say there's a lot of victories in that campaign, simply because they were able to identify that this was a clearly attack on press freedom. He didn't have what Assange in the background of the rape allegations, the smears against Assange. He didn't have that, so it's more difficult. But that sense of an attack on press freedom has, has mobilized a lot of campaigns. And I think in terms of this campaign, we need to simplify it, keep the politics, but simplify it in the sense of this is what it is, and do you support it? A bit like the days of the, of the five demands around the whole hunger strike thing, which achieves mass support, notwithstanding where it went and whatever at that time in terms of numbers. Um, I think the campaign has the chance of getting to that. Um, I hope it does, because um, Assange's own lawyers, the speculation was that he would get bail. They felt that the judge left enough regular room that he would get bail. And it showed you him not getting bail how determined they are to punish them. Like, so determined. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, Assange has been amazing, amazing campaigner for what he's done. Um, and I, I think that um, this campaign should take part from the Barry McCaffrey, Trevor Burke case. I, on a final note, I recently took over, um, uh, I didn't want to do it actually, the Belfast Secretary, but two individuals, I won't go into, were basically leaving a fit of peak and the branch was going to collapse. And me and another person stepped in. He became the chair and I became the secretary. And we've done small things since we took over. We had a massive debate internally whether we should hold a public protest about the loyalist death threats, which I was in favour of that we did hold a public protest. But there was a huge, the email correspondence on WhatsApp group was, was phenomenal. But we held it. We held that protest. Four of us went along. And the media turned out en masse. I mean, I, I, I used to go to the protest where you're lucky if you get one journalist. 
when we went outside St. Anne Cathedral in Belfast, there was about 15 to 17 representatives of the media. And that night, the next morning, it was carried on every radio station. That was a small event. But we established, and then other people who didn't support the nation, they all had to say, yeah, I hold my hands up. That was, that was really good. That was really positive. So, I mean, an Assange protest in Belfast? Yes. An Assange post pro protest that has posters simplifying the arguments with the attack on press freedom? That we invite these people who, who went to it. At, at our meeting on, um, on, on Monday, our branch meeting, we've been trying to, well, I've been pushing it, that we have a speaker on a key issue rather than just going through all the usual union machinations and all the what the treasury report and all that. And we've had 32, we had Barry McCafferty, which I was in favour of. We've had him speaking at the first one that I was branch secretary. We had a, we had a, we we're having a, a guy on Monday talking about um, new guidelines which were issued on domestic violence um, for the press by Women's Aid. And we've got a, a guy from the NUJ Ethics Committee come over to, to discuss the guidelines and what they should mean and how we could implement them in newspapers. And I'm going to propose on Monday night that we invite somebody from the, either this campaign or somebody bigger in London, whatever, but somebody from the Assange campaign to address the meeting. I don't know why I'll get it passed, but I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to, I'm going to mute it and argue for it, why we should do it. And I, I think I'm a fair chance of doing it. And I'm, and I'm very busy at the moment with the magazine, but where I can um, lend my support and, and help in any way, uh, I talk to John a lot, unfortunately, <laughs> but, but I, I'm quite willing to do what I can. And again, um, thanks to the invite tonight. It, it, it's been good to come along, meet people who are interested in this and to talk about this, but also to have hope. It's quite easy to get despondent. Um, the Barry, the Barry McCaffrey and Trevor Burney case showed that, 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 that we can have successes. I, I, maybe I'm a terrible optimist. But I, I hold on to that optimism rather than the fetishism. It's, it's, it's kind of sustained me all these barren years. Okay, I'll leave it there. <laughs>